Hello and namaste. My name is Brandon and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. In this video, we will pick up where we left off in video one of this playlist, which was an introduction to variable transformations. In this video, we will actually look at some models and some data using the very well known Boston housing data. So luckily in this video, at least, no talk about irises. And as always, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Let's get going. So why do we transform variables in the first place? A very quick review. We transform variables in the context of regression to conform to regression assumptions, which in turn amplifies predictive power and increases the overall quality of the model. The metaphor I use is like tuning up your car. So your car could have a low tire, it could have a bulb out in the tail light, it could have a bad windshield wiper or something like that. Will the car still run? Absolutely. Is it running and operating optimally? Well, no. So what we're trying to do by transforming variables is to bring all of our variables into compliance, into conformity with what the regression technique actually wants. We're not changing the variables or anything. We are just transforming them mathematically in a way that aligns them better with regression assumptions. So there are four primary reasons we do transformations. Number one, to even out the variance, which we'll see here in a couple minutes to normalize a variable, to linearize a variable, and or to reduce the impact of outliers in high leverage observations. I won't go into these in depth here because I did that in the first video. So check that out if you'd like to have more in-depth discussion of these four reasons. So a few comments about the Boston housing data set. If you study machine learning, data science, statistics, and things of that nature, I'm sure you've probably seen this data set before. It is ubiquitous in learning in those disciplines. If you're not familiar with it, a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, this data is very old. The data was collected back probably 50 years ago at this point. So the values and the numbers in there are not indicative of what those values would be uh, today, like in today's dollars and things like that. Number two, also because of the age of the data set, some of the language used in describing the variables, I find at least problematic, but we will keep in mind that it is of its time. I left it as is. We just kind of have to deal with those issues as we go forward. I also point out that this data set is about 500 observations. So it's a relatively small data set, but for the purposes of this video, it will do just fine. The one characteristic about this Boston housing data set is that all the variables are numerical which works perfectly when we're talking about transformations. So I think there are 13 independent variables here. And the last one is the target or the dependent variable, which we're trying to predict the median value of the owner occupied home that is in the data. So what's the transform process? So for this example, I performed EDA for all variables looking for potential candidates that might benefit from transformation. So the variables that appeared normally distributed as is were left as is. I didn't do anything to them. For the other variables, I examined two characteristics. The direction of the skew or the skewness, so right or left. Remember, right skewed means the long tail is to the right. So left skewed means the long tail is to the left. And then the magnitude of the skewness. Did I consider it low, medium, or high? So a low skewness might deviate slightly from a normal distribution. Medium skewness might be a bit further in one direction. Then we have a high level of skewness, which we might consider like an L or a J shape distribution. So I looked at those two things for all the variables that did not appear visually as normally distributed. For left skewed variables, a reflection was performed to make the distribution right skewed. This is similar to the setting on your phone or something like that where you flip a picture from one way to the other, maybe the text on your shirt is backwards and you flip it so the text reads correctly. Same thing here. When we have all of our distributions going in one direction, they're a little bit easier to work with. But of course, when we transform them back, we have to keep in mind that we flipped them when we did the transformation. And in later videos, I will talk more in depth about reflecting variables. Along those lines, for variables that would result in errors of say dividing by zero, or working with logarithms that can cause some problems along these lines, a constant of one was added. Again, this is common practice for transforming variables, and I will go into that in more depth in future videos. For now, I'm just telling you what I did so you understand the process. We'll learn more about it in depth later. Then based on the severity of the skewness, either a square root 
was taken for the transformation, sort of a low skewness situation, log base 10 for like a medium skewness, or one over X for a high skewness. So based on the severity of skewness, a different transform was implemented for that variable. And then after the analysis, I went back and checked all the residuals to make sure I hadn't made any mistakes in the other direction, which can happen when we're doing transformations. So what are the full results for multiple regression? Now I did not go in and like pick and choose variables. I just went ahead and dumped them all into the full model. That way I could compare sort of apples to apples. So these are full model situations. No variables have been removed when some of them might need to be, but for now, full model. So with no transforms, the adjusted R square, the most conservative measure of the amount of explained variance was 0.734. That's pretty good. Now with all the transforms in there, it went up to 0.782. That's a pretty big jump. So by performing EDA and initializing simple transformations, that's all I did here. This is just because of transformations we were able to increase the explained variance from 73.4% to 78.2% just by transformations alone. Now this increase is due to a reduction in prediction error. The reduction in error is due to conforming variables closer to regression assumptions. Given our car metaphor, we went in and pumped up the low tire. We went to the back and fixed the taillight that was out. We went up front and fixed the windshield wiper that was not working very well. We got everything running and everything sort of in compliance and everything was running much more smoothly. All we did was sort of tune it up. In this situation, we increased by 5% the explained variance just by doing transformations. Let's look at the residuals for RM, which is number of rooms. This is a bit different because I didn't transform it. So this is a variable that was already normal to begin with. So here is the residual plot. You're probably already looking at it thinking something's a bit off here. Now here is the residual plot with that transform applied to the median value. So that's the target variable. See the difference? In this case, the RM variable was not transformed at all. We left it as is. However, the dependent variable of median value of the home was transformed with the square root. So all I did was take the square root of the median value of the home. Notice how the bend in the residuals is now gone and homoscedasticity or evenness of residuals is much better on the right after that transform. So on the left, we're going to have some issues on either end of our residual plot. See how they're all above our zero line. Well, by doing the transform, we sort of unbend it. And now the residual plot is exactly what we want evenly distributed top and bottom and across the range of our variable, just by doing the square root of our target variable. So here are the age of the home residuals. So with no age transform, this is the residual plot. What does it look like to you? Here's with the age transform. So here is the age underscore T residual plot. See the difference? Notice how the V shape in the residuals is gone and homoscedasticity is better after age underscore T transform of reflection and inverse. So in this case, I reflected the variable. You can see on the left that this is a left tailed skewness. So the tails to the left. So I flipped it and then took the inverse. That was the transform here. So you look on the right, you also notice there are some values at right at one in age underscore T. That is an artifact of the transform and is expected. Doesn't cause any problems. It is just sort of a natural output of doing the transform. But you see the difference in the residuals? That's exactly what we want to accomplish by doing transforms. Last one is the distance residual plot. So here's without transformation. You can already see the shape here. With transformation, here's the shape. See the difference? So notice how the V shape in the residuals is gone and homoscedasticity is better after that transform. In this case, it was log base 10. Now, just for fun, I went ahead and did some machine learning stuff. Now, I know some of you are probably getting excited. Some of you are probably freaking out, but I wanna put the asterisk up here in the right-hand corner to point out that this is not a video about machine learning. This is not the best technique at all for machine learning or anything. I just did it 
mainly to verify what I got using regular multiple regression and see what the machine learning process would actually output for regression in this data. And just for fun, I threw in some other models just to see what would happen. Again, this is not a machine learning video. This is probably very bad technique when it comes to machine learning, but I just did it because I was in there. That's how we learn sometimes. The CV at the top just means that this is five fold cross validation. So the model divides the data set up into five even sections. Then it uses four of those to train and then one of those to test. Then it goes to the next set, uses four to train, one to test. That's what cross-fold validation means. So that's my little background on machine learning. So without any transforms, here is what we got. Now we're mainly looking at linear regression here because that's what we're comparing it against earlier in the video. So here you can see we have 0.722. That's pretty close to what we got, just doing good old fashioned multiple regression. So if you want, you can pause the video and look at the other techniques here to kind of see how they all did. In this case, in this data, the way it's set up, linear regression was not the best sort of model in terms of our R squared or our coefficient of determination. But again, I mainly did this just to sort of see what this gave me in terms of comparing it to good old fashioned multiple regression, which I did actually in Excel. So here's with the transforms. What do you notice? If you look, by performing EDA, and initializing simple transformations, we were able to increase the regression explained variance from 72.2% to 78%. This is almost exactly what we got when we looked at just regular multiple regression using Excel. We could pause this video on this slide and talk about this slide for a long time. It's very interesting. You know, the support vector machine, the SVM change is very interesting. It's a huge jump. And I'm sure there are some mathematical reasons for that. But again, I did this just to compare the regression output from this with the Excel version I did before, and they are almost exactly the same. So again, you can see a very large increase of pretty much the same magnitude. That wraps up this second video in this playlist about variable transformations, where we looked at the Boston housing data set, did various transformations that we will go into detail in in future videos. And you can see that we got a significant increase in the explained variance just by doing transformations alone. That's all we did, which can tell you that they can be very, very powerful when trying to build a highly predictive regression model. My name is Brandon. Thanks for stopping by this video. You can find me here on YouTube and on LinkedIn. I appreciate you taking your time to learn with me and I look forward to seeing you again in the next video. Take care and bye-bye.